Good evening, Felix here from Hong Kong. Great to see you guys. Uh, Chris, I did not go into hibernation, but you are quite right. I did pull up this chart here, um, the pre-market one, and I was a little bit uh, stumped. Six and a half percent, the VIX is up, which of course is an indicator that the market is down. This is extended hours, so let's go at the actual one. And coin down 10%. This is obviously a cryptos, bitcoins falling off the, the, the face of the earth uh, for once. My crypto portfolio is is looking uh, it's looking pretty uh, pretty unhappy I must say uh, absolutely everything is is massively down here uh, is there anything green well VIX is green otherwise the market is having a bit of a freak out uh, what is it all about well um, if you watched my earlier videos my, my video my my, my pre market is sort of a technical analysis roundup you were seeing that Bloomberg very helpfully put out a bunch of headlines basically inflation fears are back. Um, COVID is back and uh, the US might see 1960 style inflation. Uh, all incredibly helpful, I'm sure, to get some clicks over there, but not incredibly helpful uh, for the market here. So we are seeing uh, an absolute reversal of what we are seeing yesterday. Now, a lot of you uh, will uh, remember, of course, that when we've had these very, very dark red openings in the mornings, it doesn't necessarily always uh, translate throughout the day. And why do you think that is? Well, the data suggests that first thing in the morning, first hour or so in the morning, it's the retail investors that trade. It's you and me. We heard some news, we seen some data, we read something that scared us or made us uh, enthusiastic, and we trade straight away on that data. The so-called smart smart money it does the opposite. It basically um, waits and then buys in on, on, on much lower numbers, uh, taking advantage of our uh, sort of, uh, well, exuberance, if you will. So uh, th that seems to be what happens. And that's why you often see at the beginning of the day, relatively small volumes, but large movements in these stocks. And then during the day, you get people scooping things up again. So um, as Philip here says, the first hour and a half is always crazy. And allegedly, it's our fault. It is us retail investors that get the blame to, of that, according to the data guys. Uh, Rabi Sabi, thank you very much for smashing that like button. I uh, really, truly appreciate that. Uh, I'll see a lot of our members here. Also, Samuel, uh, Fernando, uh, Lily, um, great to see you guys. Staff, uh, hate to see you guys here on the chat. So we are, of course, going to talk a little bit about what the news are. We're going to look at some of the charts. We're going to see what's really happening here. Um, Chris hopes that NEO doesn't go below 32. Well, at the moment, we are down 3.5% at 33. So that would take a fairly strong movement during the day. Uh, but we will look at those charts, Chris. Now, what we're doing again today is you can see at the top of this chat, uh, I think I've pinned it. Did I pin it? Um, I did now, anyway, a message been pinned. You can actually call me. You can call me on Zoom and we can have a chat. Uh, and, and I've just tested it uh, properly and it, it does seem to work. So that'd be lovely to, to try that out. Marcel Doc, great to see you, Symphony. Uh, lots of uh, familiar faces here. So at the moment, uh, the market having a bit of a red morning. Uh, well, not just a bit, quite severely, especially, of course, in the crypto space. Uh, and the only uh, green thing on here literally is, is VIX, which, of course, volatility indicator, which indicates that the market is going down and let's have a quick look at the bonds well they're up a touch 0.8 percent i don't think that in itself is really what's causing it i think it's just a lot of uh just people are just a bit you know sitting on the edge of their seat basically that that's where they're where they're living so let me just pull up here uh um Roji boy i think i've got you here on the live so let me see if we can have a quick chat and then we go into some news but let's do it let's do a quick one i'm kind of edging to uh, to try this out so um narendra there if you are with us you're going to be joining us for a second as well um Bobby Sabi, thanks for the mic sound I'm, I'm i'm glad that's a little bit of an improvement uh, and i'm going to ask you to unmute here narendra and then we should be able to at least hear you if you have video you can also turn that on uh, but that is of course up to you at the moment though you have to hit the unmute button otherwise we can't hear you um and if you don't do that, Narendra, um, I will continue here. So you have to smash the unmute button, Narendra, and then you can talk. So, uh, Hello. Hi, Narendra. I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, shout. What's your question? I don't really have a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely of you um, to join us. Maybe where, where, I, where are you I could get your thoughts on... Uh, I'm from Malaysia. Okay, great. Maybe I could get your thoughts on tea with the reason measure announcement which stock uh at&t 
AT&T, okay. Um, AT&T having an interesting, didn't they just cut, um, didn't they just cut, um, uh, didn't they just cut their uh, dividends? Did I read that right? Yeah, 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 they did. But they're, they're having like a merger situation going on right now. Yeah, so they are, Okay, so there's a statement here saying uh, John Malone says he fully supports Discovery Warner Media transaction. Logic of this investment synergistic combination under leadership is appealing. Um, so it toughens up the deal for cable wireless, says UBS. So the banks are with them on it. 43 billion cash and debt deal to spin off its Warner Media assets and merge them with Discovery. Uh, so it's going to be spun off into Discovery, basically. Um, the deal reportedly will leave Viacom and NBC with fewer options. Um, the at and ski transaction could also spark additional discussions in this initial looks to scale. Um, analysts said investors ought to take notice of the focus on fiber investment at at and which is rolling out 5G fast and has more capital at its disposal for investment purposes. So basically, UBS take on this seems to be that it's good. They're spinning off something kind of non-core. Uh, they're getting money for it. They're getting cash for it. Um, and they can then invest that into fiber and 5G. And they might therefore um, uh, get actually become a, a better business in the long run. Um, and including the dividend cut, they're going to have eight to eight point six billion a year um, available. Well, I mean, I, I think the market obviously isn't a big fan. Uh, I think a lot of people hold AT and T as a sort of uh, uh, you know aristocrat of the dividend space. And that is kind of the sole reason why they're holding it. And if you sort of go back over time, you kind of get the idea why that is the sole reason why anybody would hold that stock. Because let me just see if this might load a longer chart here. So if we look at five years here, you see, you know, how much money you would have lost over the period you would have bought at 39, now you're 28. So the only reason anybody is insane enough to hold that is because they think somehow the dividends, um, kind of outweigh them. So to turn the dividend business around into a more of a genuine growth business, I think it's a very, very hard feat. So if I had to bet on one thing today, it would be against AT&T. Um, as always, guys, of course, I should have always put that up. This is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only, uh, as usual. So I, I think this is a little bit of a tough pill to swallow for a lot of AT&T shareholders uh, because um, it's not really what they signed up for. Uh, management might like it. The banks will like it. The lawyers will like it. They'll all make money out of this deal. Uh, they're probably incentives for executives, as they usually are. Uh, but at and in the today falling off 2%, yesterday 5.8% off, the day before 2 7%. So we have about 10% down here, uh, a stock that was already pretty beaten up, I, I, I would say, at least in, in the in the medium term. So yeah, thanks very much for that question, Narendra. Have you, you got anything else you want to say, you want to shout out? <laughs> um, would you label uh, the new merger uh, company that's coming out from this deal as a growth company? Because essentially it will compete against Netflix. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I love subscription businesses. So a bigger um, kind of streaming company with more content might find it more easy if they combine brands. And you kind of have to wait if they see if they do that. Are they going to combine, um, you know, a discovery with, with, with the other brands that come out of AT&T. If they do do that, they could create one stronger brand, uh, therefore with more trajectory for more faster subscriber growth. I don't know whether there are price differences between the different uh, companies with subscription models and all, the, all those kind of technicals, uh, but it could be, there is a sense of bigger is better in that space because it's all about content, right? The more content you have, uh, the more likely people are going to pay your subscription fee for for that so it will make it harder for the smaller players and i think we will see a lot more consolidation in, in that space i think we'll also see new startups but they will probably get swallowed up by the big guys a little bit like you see in the social media space you know anything good that comes out gets gobbled up by facebook or somebody or other so i think it could be good for for um, for discovery in a sense but um, you have to kind of really look into the details there of uh, what are the subscription tiers, who's charging what, how who's got what sub subscribers, what's the overlap, uh, and how much extra could you charge for the combined offering if, if that's something that they might be, might be able to do. Um, 
So, you know, th thanks very much for those questions. They are very interesting, Narendra, uh, and I always appreciate you, you joining in. Thank you. All right, pleasure. See you on the next one. Bye. Yeah. Um, right, guys, I think you could hear that, right? Uh, which is fantastic. So if you are minded to call in, you can also turn your videos on. In the meantime, let me run through a little bit of new news here. Um, um, Philip is asking here, though, uh, was yesterday a bull trap? Was so positive after yesterday, it feels like I'm going to go in a circus laughing and smiling and suddenly the clown kicks you in the balls, uh, steals your popcorn, Philip. And that's precisely what the market is doing. So the market is kind of in this real sort of irrational space where we just zip zip up and down every time we recover a little bit uh, we kind of go down again so we kind of get these panics these fears of inflation or some other catastrophe calamity that's going to hit us and then we get a big sell-off and then we get you know look at look at neo for example it's, it's a good example actually that represents pretty much this high growth market we get let me zoom in for you on this one here. So you get one day here on the 13th of May, 7.5% down. The next day you go up 7%. Now that doesn't, of course, offset the previous day. And then the next day, 1.1% up, 1% up. So you're back to where you started three days later. And you're thinking, hey, this feels lovely. This feels nice. But that is exactly what a sort of bull trap definition is. It looks and feels like it's a bull rally, but it really isn't. It just recoups the kind of excessive losses of a couple of days ago, you probably then recover a little bit too much uh, and then you're going down again. And what's a good indicator for that? Well, actually, volume's a good indicator for that because if you can look at this here, that's a nice green trajectory, right? Even if I can't draw a straight line, uh, but you see my straight line there and then look at volume at the same time, right? Volume is sort of going down. Neo, a little unusually actually here, uh, has that. If you look at something like Palantir, for example, you get a little bit more of a, well, you know, you also get this sort of story. You essentially get a, a nice recovery here. And at the same time, volume falls off. And that just means that there weren't many people in on those trades. There wasn't a lot of momentum behind it. It wasn't the whole market buying in. It was just a few people and a few people therefore could move and make the market. Uh, and that's how you quite easily get these, these kind of bull traps. Um, my guess, Adam is saying that inflation is really transitory because high prices will stop people from buying things like lumber. Um, I, I love the fact that you were, used the word transitory. I think the Fed has done the biggest PR campaign to revive a word that no one has ever uttered in the last 10 years, transitory. Uh, and that they keep saying that, then they're basically saying a lot of this inflation is basically not here to stay. It's just going to disappear. Some of that is, is, is shortages of um, raw materials. Some of it is transport related because of COVID. Um, you know, you have lumber, for example. I don't know whether that's a transport issue, but like a lot of the chips, a lot of the raw materials, a lot of that is actually a um, a logistics issue. So they're saying all of that's going to go away once COVID fizzles out. And therefore, this is not really something that we need to be worrying about. So that's uh, thanks very much for shouting that out there. Uh, that is an interesting one. Um, Right, guys, um, if you have any more questions, all right, let's run through a little bit of Neo news here then, um, as nobody wants to talk to me, which is <laughs> fair enough. Uh, what's quite interesting, if you look at the Neo options, I know I should never start a sentence with, it's quite interesting because it probably means it isn't. But I think in this case, uh, you, you might find it is. And look at the calls, uh, the, the volume really picking up very nicely, right? Sort of 10, 20% up on basically every price level, pretty substantial volume here, 39, 11, 17,000, between sort of 34, $35. And then scroll down to the puts and see down 40%, down 60%, down 30%. The whole thing is down about 20, 30% at every price level. And what does that mean? Well, puts are bets that the stock is falling and everyone's getting out of it. And look at the volume. The highest volume we have here is 8,500 puts at that price level, whereas on the calls, we have 39,000 uh, uh, calls, which are people betting on it going up. And if you go back about a month or so, or two months even, it was pretty even. The volumes were, were pretty even. So there is basically no one really um, buying options for NEO to fall. Uh, and that is, is interesting to see. And it kind of just means that the market as a whole seems to think that where we are right now, tinkering around our uh, $33 here, 
is is a price that is unlikely to get much cheaper uh, and that is, is something i mean it's not quite what we want you know we want new at 50 uh, but we have to kind of take what, what we get so i think that is quite a um, an insightful number here if you just look at those those put numbers so i always encourage you to have a look at those because they give you quite a lot of insight into what people are are thinking um Kathy Woods has said that his inflation interest rate fears are unfounded. Uh, thanks for, for joining YouTubing. Um, I, I also, I, I don't fear inflation. I think it's the opposite. I fear deflation. And I think the Fed might too. They want inflation because the opposite is actually what's terrifying, uh, whereas this is, is, is not. Uh, a bit of inflation is a good thing. Actually, a lot of companies will make more money in inflationary markets because they can raise their prices a little bit more than inflation, hence improve their margins a bit. Uh, Damien here, uh, welcome from Poland. Uh, you are uh, asking, uh, has when can we conclude that Palantir has changed direction? All right, let me, let me um, pull that up then. Okay, so this is Palantir here. Uh, you know, is this really a bull run or is it, as we are saying, is it a, uh, a, a bull trap? Well, one thing you can look at is when you have green days, um, you want your volume at the same time to increase. That's sort of the simplest thing. And at the moment, you can see it's going up and the volume is declining. So that's sort of telling you the opposite story. Uh, you can also use indicators um, to like momentum, for example, you can use that to tell you whether momentum is improving. And if you want to do that, always change the colors to something you can actually see, not this sort of ochre, uh, unpleasant color. And then when it gives you these kind of green areas, that's when uh, things are, uh, are actually improving in terms of momentum. At the moment, we are moving up, but not into anything green. It's still red here, the number. And there are a number of other indicators you can look at. I mean, there are, there are plenty. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, do check out um, my course. I teach you quite a lot of technical analysis, also fundamentals, of course, but also a lot of technicals because it, is, it can be quite useful. So this here, for example, uh, RSI, quite simple. You draw a line at the 50 point mark here, and then when it crosses from below above, you get a buy signal. And you see this here, it went near it, but it wasn't a buy signal. And the last ones were also sort of fizzled out. You see the last peaks here, that was the peak up there. Not really much of a buy signal. You wouldn't really want to trade on that because it just sort of uh, kind of moved. This here is a buy signal. So what we got here, uh, you know, that kind of a movement is, is a clear movement upwards. And at the moment, we're sort of fizzling around. Uh, are we buying? Not quite. And then we sort of uh, sell off again. So at the moment, uh, I would say, no, I don't see a, a real momentum turnaround yet. Uh, it can come, of course, but at the moment, we don't see it. And I do think Palantir actually probably needs some more numbers, some more contracts some more announcements to really get people um, on their side. Earnings were good. I think they were very good, in fact, but still not quite enough to, uh, to convince people. And there was an interesting statistic on our Discord earlier, which um, Baba, Gusta, Baba Bustagut, that's a great screen name, uh, shared with us very kindly. I'll magnify that for you here. Uh, institutional ownership of Palantir is 17.8%. Uh, Facebook is 78%. Amazon, 58%. Microsoft, 69%. So you can see that institutions on large, the big guys are not really in on Palantir yet. Though talking about Palantir, um, there is an interesting story out today, and that is that the Founders Fund which is a fund run by Peter Thiel, have upped their stake in Palantir by 51,000% uh, to 21 million shares. Uh, and Founders Fund is an interesting one here. You see it. Uh, they invest in things like SpaceX, Palantir, Stripe, Facebook, Airbnb, lots of really good stuff. So very interesting that given that Peter Thiel already owns 16% of Palantir, he has just bought another percent in a bit uh, through his fund. Uh, and that is a kind of, the kind of bullish sign that we look for. Uh, in itself, of course, it isn't enough. Uh, and this obviously happened at some time in the last quarter. We don't know exactly when. Uh, but that is the sort of thing that we need more of. And if we get more of that, then I think we have a good chance to actually uh, do something uh, about this stock. Now, let me go back here, guys. Now, guys, as I say down below, you can call me, if you like, on Zoom. Literally, in the live chat at the top, there is a message with the link to the Zoom link, and you can call me 
live here and we can chat on video and we can have a laugh. So do check that out if you are so interested. Um, can you not join the Zoom link on the phone? Uh, Chris is asking, uh, well, you don't have to turn the video on if you don't want to, Chris, although you're missing half the fun. Uh, but yeah, I think if you you can watch me on YouTube on the phone and then you can click on the link on the phone and you can still uh, be on here. Absolutely. You don't need to have a, a computer for that. Zoom works on all devices. So do check it out. I think it might be quite, quite a laugh. Um, now, a couple of bits of Neo news. Um, we have a bit of Neo news out, and one of the most important ones is that the city of Chongqing, which is a pretty major Chinese city, I've been there, uh, uh, have announced a subsidy policy uh, for of seventy eight thousand US dollars for each battery swap station built in the city. Now, in a Neo battery swap station, the version two. It costs about 220, 230,000 US dollars. So this is one third of the ticket price. So this is quite an interesting and profitable thing, clearly aimed at NEO and to some extent probably to the guys building uh, um, the battery swapping for the, the taxis and, and the things like that. Uh, but um, do we stay in the call? Uh, Roti Boy is asking, well, you can, I, you mean, does your YouTube still work? I think maybe your YouTube pauses while you are on the Zoom call, I imagine, but if you're doing it from a phone. But I tried that earlier. All you need is the Zoom app. Um, I think you do. I think if you are in a browser, you don't need the app. Uh, but um, it, it doesn't really require you to sign up or anything. You literally just click in with your Gmail account uh, and then it works. So uh, this is quite an interesting subsidy here story. And there's actually, this is the Chinese law or announcement from the China government website. And it's basically a kickoff from the Chinese national government. They're saying to regional governments, you guys have to support battery swapping. Uh, we want this to be a national policy. So here we see, this is the first time I've seen this in China. And I am hoping that this is going to be rolled out. It's very rare that you see one region or one city do something without everybody else following in China. So uh, watch this space. We might see Neo's battery. The battery swap station version two is already half the price to the previous one. Uh, now, if a third of it gets built by the paid for by the government, if they get the land for free through all the, um, the deals that they've got going, this is becoming a rather affordable uh, infrastructure setup. And here is another deal, which is a um, co-op deal with China's leading tourism group. Uh, the company is called Folly Day. They own a uh, group of um, uh, hotels called, I want to say Atlantic. Is it called Atlantic? I think it is. Um, I can't see it here at the moment. But yeah, anyway, they own high-end tourism. Uh, so it makes sense again that they're going to build together infrastructure and uh, a Neo will put the hotel offerings onto the Neo app. And that's the, going to be the power of the Neo app. They're going to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people over time who are quite affluent and they know where they are and they can offer them targeted kind of special offer rewards types things in all sectors of, of, of consumption. And the companies they're partnering with are happy and in return, they're giving them um, access to their sites and, and helping them to build the infrastructure here, which I think is pretty interesting. So another uh, long-term strategic deal here from NEO. Um, We also have NEO's, the first ET7, the proper one is actually built. And it's a validation build. What is a validation build? Well, you basically build it completely with all the components and all the parts. And then your engineers tweak it a little bit. But really the main point is that you tweak your manufacturing line. If you tweak your, your whole assembly line to make this more efficient. And you can also use these builds for uh, regulatory approvals, probably for crash tests, which seems rather sad, doesn't it? Uh, but this one might perhaps you know be driven against the wall at some point but it just shows how far they are, are in, in terms of their production and we also have been told in early january you can test drive the et7s and by march they'll be delivering them so they're doing things speedily at neo which is is fantastic Uh, Stefan, uh, welcome here. You're saying Alton can do battery swap in 20 seconds. Well, Alton are the ones who are building the, 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 the NEO uh, stations as well. Uh, and, and NEO is actually an investor. Well, NEO Capital, I should say, is an investor in, in Alton. If you go on the... Um, they actually have an English site now, NEO Capital. You can see the investments they've made. And Alton here, battery swapping technology and solutions. So these are the guys who are also building the, uh, the, the NEO stations. So... Uh, 
as that technology proceeds, uh, I'm sure it'll get faster and faster and faster. Uh, at the moment, I think they are, I don't know, the website isn't loading, but they're promising us three minutes. I suppose that also perhaps means driving in and driving out and all that kind of stuff, but I'm sure it's going to get uh, much faster. 20 seconds sounds pretty challenging. But um, yes, Chris Jones here is saying that the Neo app is like the Amex Office app. You are right, exactly. You'll get in, in a sort of elite audience and that is worth something. And they could actually monetize as well that down the road. I'm going to hit the button here on percentages. Okay, E-Hang falling off a cliff, MP materials, un un unexplained for no particular reason. Uh, Sundial, Hillion, SOS, Tesla, every, basically everything growthy is absolutely down here. Um, the Chinese e-commerce platforms are performing the best here at the moment, uh, as is the more traditional stuff, PayPal, Amazon, etc. But even the banks are down. JP Morgan is down. So this is just a one of those days where the market sells off indiscriminately. And you know what that generally means? It's generally a fairly good buy opportunity because... If everything is sold off, it means everything is bad. Uh, and that rarely happens because some of these companies on here are very good and some of them are uh, really rather terrible. I'm not, not going to tell you which one I think are terrible, you know, except I'm pointing my finger at this one here. Um, but, um, you know, not terrible, but just overvalued. Uh, so it is just one of those days where really uh, I, I should be doing some shopping after this call. But um, it's not going to be a good day to look at the portfolio. Uh, LA Jolly, you're asking, what do I think about XPAN compared to NEO? Um, and everything is in gold. Absolutely. Gold is, is going up here, the whole sector. Uh, a little bit, yes. Uh, what is AU? Can you find that? No. No, but yeah, you're right. Absolutely. So this is proper inflation fears, fears mongering here. And target. Apparently, everyone's running to target. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, very, very little. Um, that is actually green here. Literally almost impossible to find anything green on this map here. Salesforce up a little bit. But yeah, an unusual day, I, I, I would say, that we have in the market here. Um, Xpang versus Neo. It's a good company. Uh, I, I think they will do well. I think they are part of this um, three musketeers band that we have. Um, but it is... Um, the branding isn't quite the same as Neo. So they are less likely to be this sort of Apple type super brand with this incredibly loyal following. I read an article on the Chinese website yesterday. It said, why are Neo users brainwashed or something like that? I'll put it a little bit more positively, but it meant it in a positive way. So like, how do they achieve this incredible user loyalty? And I don't think Xpang or Li are quite getting there. I think they're building good cars. I think they're building good companies, but they're not quite uh, getting there uh, at all. Um, Philip is saying prices are so low in target that inflation would affect them until it hits 20%. Um, are you saying it wouldn't affect? Well, if their, if their input prices go up, I think target would have quite a tough time raising prices. I think people are pretty pretty uh, price sensitive in, uh, in target, aren't they? Uh, but obviously, um, uh, there's something there that we haven't thought of. Or perhaps there's some actual target news uh, that we don't know about. Why don't we, why don't we look it up? as we are talking about to target, see if there's some news out on target. Um, consumer stocks for pre-market targets, target posts higher Q1 adjusting. Okay, they got earnings out. Look at that. Um, they have earnings out of 369 per share up from 59 cents a year earlier. And the prediction was 22%. So they are beat earnings by about 50% here. And revenue is 24 billion, store sales rose 18% year on year. And they expect Q2 comparable sales growth in the mid to high single digits. So that's very, very good for them. So they are, they've just produced stellar numbers. So therefore, they deserve to rally here up 5% today. One of the very, very few positive stocks we're going to find here. Um, Richard, yes, you are, you are right. There is an article. I also shared that on, uh, on the Discord that... Um, there is an article out indeed that there is this company here, Marla develops magnet-free motors for electric vehicles. Uh, but I think the, the issue is still, it takes years for this technology to be proven and rolled out and, and that kind of thing. So I don't think it is a short-term solution, but in the long run, it could take some shine off the rare earth place as well. Um, 
graphene batteries, do you think this could be a threat to lithium miners? I, I, to be honest with you, TGO TV, I, I'm not the super expert there on the mining stuff. We have somebody in our community called Robert who isn't on the call, sadly, because he'd be able to answer that question for you uh, in, in a snap. Um, from what I'm seeing is I do think lithium or at least core lithium is going to be a great great part of, of, of batteries for several years to come. Because again, uh, technology takes time, uh, the supply chains take time. So I don't think it's going to be an issue for the next perhaps two or three years. After that, yes, I think it is possible that we are going to see a substantial difference in what's actually put into these batteries. But I think at the moment, uh, lithium is, is going to be, be um, the way. Uh, Eugene, uh, great, great of you to join. Um, you want me to look at Tesla? Uh, how low do I, do I think that can go? Well, I think Tesla is um, is a very volatile stock because it is so much kind of PR based, right? So we have, they are somewhat linked, I think, to the negative crypto story because of everything that Elon was shouting out. A lot of the crypto guys are not very fond of Elon at the moment, and therefore they might not be that fond of buying Tesla. Um, and that might seem like a small thing, but it's a, it's a fairly major thing. We've had a lot of unfortunate press coverage of the whole China stuff, the April delivery numbers, which I thought were extraordinarily good. The press kind of turned that into a negative China story. Somehow it really didn't make any sense at all. JP Morgan also came out and said, that makes no sense. April numbers were fantastic. Uh, the car industry is cyclical, guys. Uh, and April numbers were better than December numbers. And December is always the biggest delivery a month for any car company. So if April is better than December, what's the next December going to look like? Well, it's going to be out of this world. So I think in terms of numbers, it's going to be great. But for this quarter, they apparently sold out. Apparently they have this backlog of 10,000 cars, which are sort of finished, but idling around because they're still missing something. So those kind of things, of course, are not what you want to hear in your growth stocks and your growth story. Um, so therefore, they are on this negative trajectory here. Um, I, I would say that there is this sort of 538 support line here, which is where we briefly dipped on the 5th of March. Um, I think that's a pretty good one. Uh, we also have here the 200 day moving average line, which we have fallen below. You see that here. And that rarely happens. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be called the 200 day moving average line. The last time that happened was, uh, let me go back a few years. Um, I think in March 2020, very, very briefly. And before that, uh, yeah, before that in sort of October 2019. So that's a pretty rare event itself. And there will be some people who see this as a buying opportunity. But at the moment, I think people are probably waiting this out a little bit to see uh, how much further can we slide. Because Tesla isn't down 5% because there's something bad happening at Tesla. Uh, though I should check the news. I don't think there is. So um, it is more to do with the market, right? The market, the whole growth market is just down like that. So it's an indiscriminate sell-off here. Uh, the, the, the slightly green day yesterday was actually on a little bit better volume. So that was something that was sort of more positive, but it wasn't giving us real kind of rallying momentum here. Um, guys, you can call me on Zoom. Uh, I've put the link above. Uh, I, will, I will, in fact, I'll post it again. Um, let me see if I can do that. Can I do that? I think I can copy link. I'm going to post it in here, guys. You can, uh, that says YouTube. I think that should work. I think that should become a, no, can't do that. Okay, let me copy and paste it again from directly from Zoom, guys. If you want to ask me anything, you want to talk to me, um, invite, copy, invite link. All you got to do is uh, click on this. And you can be live on here uh, for the world to see and you can ask me questions and I can't possibly avoid you. Uh, so that's also something. Um, now let's have a look at NEO. So NEO, actually, let's have a look at the intraday chart here because uh, that's going to be quite interesting uh, what's really happened here. So let's make this a little bit bigger. So we opened here uh, with a bit of a drop well not just a bit of a drop right if that's pre-market 34 to 32 80 and since then we've had some support here at 30 to 74 now we've dropped dipped a little bit lower 30 to 60 but we are moving up again a little bit we do see these pretty big sell-off move movements here right that this was how many fifteen thousand shares for example in one minute here it traded just uh, three minutes ago or so but now we are, we are moving up a little bit so 
yes, it is down 4%, uh, but it at the moment seems to be finding its feet a little bit here. Um, So guys, uh, let's have a quick roundup here of the market crikey. So coin really getting hit there. And that is the unfortunate side of being completely linked to basically crypto or particularly Bitcoin performance because they are dependent on you and me trading crypto. And the people who've bought Bitcoin, I think a lot of them will just sit this out. Well, obviously some have sold, otherwise we wouldn't have gone down this far. Uh, but it just stopped the, uh, the the trading. It makes it somewhat less appealing. So we have this incredible, look, the volatility is up 12%. I mean, that's actually almost, a, that's a chart we kind of want to look at really. So we have here VIX, uh, volatility of the S&P really shooting up here. Uh, let's look at the day chart. And you can see that's pretty substantial. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay, let me zoom in. Can we zoom in, please? May we have a zoom? There we go. So you can see, yeah, pretty, pretty big jump. Well, we had these before, though, haven't we? On the 13th of May, uh, 12th of May, we were in similar territory. But yeah, massive, massive jump there from the volatility index, up 20% now, uh, according to this. Uh, let's also have a look at VXN, which is the same indicator for the NASDAQ. Uh, up 10 percent so still very very substantial movement there and if you're looking at uh, uh, spy here you know we are down a percent and a half which doesn't sound so bad but the volatility is pretty tremendous let's have a look at qqq to see what the market's doing down also percent and a half um Okay, no one's calling me on Zoom. <laughs> the other day I put this on, eight people called at the same time. Uh, but that's quite all right, guys. Uh, I'm not going to force you. So you, um, if we look back at NEO, at the NEO chart, uh, what have we got? Well, we were sort of expecting really to trade kind of sideways. We weren't really expecting much of a rally because this sort of little little bull run there, it did look very much like a like a, like a bit of a false indicator. So we are now down 4%, which quite frankly is not that much volatility. We are at the moment at the low of the 17th of May, so the low of two days ago. Um, so, you know, we are just hobbling sideways here. And I think the EV sector is going to continue to do that for a little while. Why? Because, well, let me just crank on my, uh, my air here for a moment, because it is getting hot in here. Um, you know, we have a chip shortage, right? So they can't, they can't really deliver more than we expect them to deliver. Deliver. We know what the limitations are. So, you know, we're not going to be able to, to get any further. Um, AT Fefik, uh, hello there to Stockholm. Uh, great to see you on here. Vengadoro, you are shy. Oh, I don't believe you. You are shy. I don't expect that at all. Um, so we do have... You know, we are still, thankfully for NEO, somewhat above these last couple of days. So, uh, you know, 3190 is probably the, the, the strongest support level we have. Uh, so it'd be lovely, of course, to close today above $34 again. It is entirely still possible. Um, but um, yeah, it, it is just one of those days. It is just one of those days where basically uh, people like Bloomberg uh, kind of, uh, you know, mess up our, our numbers. Bitcoin also was wiped up 500 billion and that will affect a lot of people's sentiment, right? They're not going to buy that much. Um, although Kathy Woods, indeed, ARK has bought a little bit of Tesla, a couple of thousand shares, not that much this morning. Um, and that is, of course, something. Um, you know, US tech, st tech stocks extend route, slight amid crypto route markets wrap. Spectre of 1960s inflation takeoff haunts US economy today. Why only today if there's any news in that? Um, inflation rekindles niche market. I mean, you know, they are just talking up inflation here. The housing market has a bottleneck that's even bigger than lumber. Um, you have to subscribe to read that happy news. Um, so this is just the sentiment and, and it's just, you know, what, what's, what's sort of coming out here today. We should also have out today, let me just look at our economic calendar here, a little bit of news. Um, today is, hang on, 20th, no, 19th, no, actually we only have, according to this, 
Oh, hang on, we're in April. Why are we in April? <laughs> Why is it showing us April? Uh, we're looking at uh, today. The FOMC minutes, indeed, they are coming out today. And that is, is going to be a core uh, item. Uh, though, bear in mind, they are going to be out of date uh, because they will have been put out before we've had uh, the, the latest data out. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one today uh, to see how that is going to play out. People are going to interpret absolutely every single word of that as they always do in comb, fine, the true of the fine tooth, tooth, tooth cone. And what it always does, guys, is it reminds us that there could be inflation. Every time the Fed opens its mouth, it basically reminds us of inflation. Um, uh, Chris, you have nothing to say until this market recovers. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Trapper is saying buy Ford. Yeah, did you see Biden um, driving around in a Ford, uh, that, which was kind of nice? But um, it one of the interesting things he did say was that there was a lovely picture of him. There's a nice video of him also driving around uh, with with one of these. Yeah, here we go. Uh, there he is. Um, he did say he sort of did a little speech and he said, you know, the future of car manufacturing is electric. Uh, there is nothing to talk about here. That's just the, that's just the, the truth. And that, of course, is a big boost for the EV sector because that's, you know, that makes it makes it true. That makes it real. Uh, so in a sense, that's a positive thing. Would I buy Ford? Mm, I, I, I don't think I would. Uh, and I'm going to show you why I wouldn't. I appreciate some people think it's a bargain. Uh, I, I'm not really with you on that one, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, F, great ticker, but go back a little bit, right? Five years, for example. You would have bought year, five, Ford five years ago at 13. Now it's 11. So if that doesn't convince you, uh, have a look at... Um, uh, let, me, let me show you some numbers. So if we type Ford in here... Ford Motors, um, well, what do we want? We want overview. So yeah, a little bit of recovery in recent times, but go back in time, right? So if you would have bought Ford 20 years ago, you would have bought it at 28, now you're at 11. Um, if you look at their finances, look at the highlight numbers. Um, can we just see, uh, let me get a little chart here. Yes, we can. So net income here, right? This is uh, month by month. I, always the, the last trailing 12 months, a so year by year. And look at that. Look how that how volatile that is, right? It just depends on the market. Incredibly cyclical business. And uh, while they have done that, look at their total debt, right? So since 2011, their debt is like doubled almost, probably about doubled. Uh, their net income is been declining and incredibly hard to impossible to predict uh, while revenue has actually gone up so the business is getting worse the profitability is getting worse they're piling up more debt and the stock is totally underperforming so uh, not something that i want to invest in um, I, 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 I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but then you guys have to make up your own minds, of course, whether you think something is is a steal. Um. <laughs> uh, Mohammed, I think you are voicing the Elon sentiment very much that a lot of people are having, which is obviously why why Tesla is not doing particularly well today, uh, down four percent, though still similar to what Neo is doing. Um, Someone was saying XPang is doing well today. Let me have a look. Uh, where did XPang go? Oops, so it fell off our list, did it, for some reason. Lee Auto, 1.6% down. XPang still down a touch here, just a little bit. Um, you think someone joined the Zoom like five minutes ago? Uh, sorry, guys, somebody did. I can't see you. I should get that little notification here. I'm looking at it. If you want to call me guys hit the zoom link above it's in the in the live chat uh, up there and then you can call me and you can ask me any question anything you want here it is again the link if you if you want to see it and you can call me on video or, or not video if you don't want me on, want to be seen you know sitting there they're, they're naked in your boxes uh, and, and you can ask me anything you want um Okay, here's somebody somebody in the waiting room uh, and I'm going to let you in studio OKS um whoever that is 
Ah, there are a few more now. A few. Uh, okay, Studio OKS, you need to uh, unmute if you haven't already, and then you can ask me a question. We're waiting for his audio or, or her audio to, to work. Uh, Elon thumbs his nose at the SEC and moves markets with a word, CH. You're absolutely right there. Okay, Studio OKS, I've asked you to unmute, so please hit that unmute button and then we can hear you as well. Um, Vefk is saying buy Ligma. What's great about Ligma? Okay, uh, this friend uh, dropped out. So we're going to try the next one here. Ethila, uh, I'm adding you uh, and I'm going to ask you to... Okay, you don't look quite like Ethila, but uh, you should be live. We should be able to hear you if you can say something. No, nope, he's also dropped out. Okay, so people are having, having a bit of a challenge here with Zoom. It did work. We did do one earlier, uh, earlier so it does work. But um, what's the new entry point for NEO, says Crypto? Well, if we do look at the NEO chart, which, uh, where did I have it? I had it somewhere. Let me open another one here. I'm going to move this over here so I can see you guys if you're in the waiting room. So I can see you now if you're in the waiting room, uh, which you're not. And let's open NEO here. So what's the entry point really for NEO? Well, I mean, given the zigzag we are seeing at the moment, you just don't know that we are at the bottom of the market yet, right? I think inflation concerns are still accelerating somewhat and it's going to, it's going to creep back up. And especially uh, given that at the moment, actually, our bond yields, 10-year ten year, ten year bond yields are pretty low, 1.62. That's pretty low. We've been at 1.8. Uh, when those do go to 1.9 and 2, I think we might see a bit more pressure on, on these growth stocks. So therefore, I think even though the shorts are out, no one's really shorting NEO at all. No one's buying uh, put, put options. At the same time, uh, everyone's kind of a little bit on the edge. No one really quite knows uh, where this is going to go. The momentum at the moment doesn't tell us yet that the momentum is back in on this. So the way I always like to prefer to buy is once things go up and my momentum is turned around, I buy a little bit here in slices and then it might go down a little bit. I don't buy it buy up here again. I wait till my momentum turns around and I buy a little bit here. And it means, yes, I don't buy the absolute bottom of the dip, but at least I buy things that are going up uh, with, with positive momentum behind it so that's always what i i look at it uh, while is saying x pangs back in the green um uh, alexander what are your thoughts on cciv i think potentially uh, cciv is is a great company because it's an american ev company premium evs great backers great story good looking car uh, but it is at a stage where risk is very substantial because manufacturing risk, scaling up risk is pretty substantial. So would I buy it at this particular point? Well, my momentum is basically this, right? So I don't really like to buy things where I'm really buying that much against the trend for a speculative growth stock. If I'm buying something that's massively profitable with a great business, a great moat and, and a history, then and it's getting punished unfairly, I'll gladly buy uh, the, 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 the dip or the sell-off. Um, but here you have kind of prospects of potential future growth possibly a great brand, possibly a great car, possibly that people want to, want to buy or not, uh, possibly a company that will have chips and batteries or not. And so there is a lot of risk in here. So at the moment, I think uh, it, it, I, I, would, I would look at this with caution because it's exceptionally speculative at the moment. Uh, you know, fair value is, is where is it exactly? That's, that's the question. Uh, so far, $17 is as low as we've gone, basically $17.20. Um, could we go a little bit lower? I think it is possible. I, I'm not bearish on, on it. I just think uh, it's a little early. It's basically a private equity uh, uh, investment that you're making here uh, uh, that hasn't produced anything yet. <laughs> what are your thoughts on GME right now, says Philco? Philco, great to see you on here. Uh, Philco, I had to look earlier, actually, the short float on GME is still 20% which is therefore still, in theory, ripe for squeezing. And I think that's really what people are going for here in the last few days. Um, 
at the moment of today, it's, it's down 4.8%. So at the, today, it's following the market, which sort of means perhaps people are sitting on the sidelines uh, or uh, perhaps the, the bullish sentiment isn't quite as strong as it has been in the past. Uh, I would expect this to continue to be incredibly volatile. Uh, valuations are completely detached from the business. Uh, you know, it's worth something down here in the, in, in the teens. That's the actual company worth. Uh, everything else is speculation. So this is, this is, uh, this is casino stuff. And nothing wrong with that. You just have to realize that you are putting your money into casino stuff. Uh, if you are a sizable player and you can actually, uh, you know, move the market and you see, or at least you can observe where the herd is going uh, and, and you can join the herd, you can be right with the herd, you can make money with the herd. Uh, just when the herd has profited, uh, make sure you jump out. Otherwise, you, you're going to see, you know, things coming down again. I mean, we've had some pretty ugly days, right? 30% down in, in, in a day and that sort of thing. So, uh, again, I, I'd really uh, urge caution here. Uh, Hans, you have a short call on GME at 800 strike price for July expiry um, at 800. Really? 800? Have we ever been that high? Um, okay, uh, Hans, I'd love to hear your, your, your uh, thoughts on that. Um, Stephanie or Stefan rather, uh, continue uh, the great contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm long on all growth stocks, including Barber, Palantir. Thank you for always tuning in. Uh, do feel free, if you guys want to, you can hit that um, Zoom call and you can, you can call me and you can chat with me if you, if you want to. Um, uh, while he is talking about Fubo TV, he's saying, I don't think streaming live TV will take over cable. What about the current market cap of the companies that are considered high, low or average? I actually think that streaming will take over cable. Um, I don't think cable will be required anymore. Uh, in most places around the world, we now have pretty decent internet connections, and that's only going to get better with 5G and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think cable businesses are a challenging one, unless they can hook it up to a streaming business that's particularly great. Um, as to the valuation of Fubo, uh, well, why don't we chuck it in here? if we can. I don't know if they have it on here. Yes, they do. So let's have a look at um, valuations. So do, do, do. financial analysis, multiples. Let's have a look at some multiples. The multiples are always a pretty rough way of looking at things. You have to appreciate that. Price to book is 8.9x. Um, last 12 month sales is 15 x so it's come down quite a bit, right? It was in the sort of 25 range, and now it's at 50, oh, now it's at 8.7. Sorry, apologies. So it's 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 come down a lot, 8.7 x. Um, the question really is, with those things always, don't look at the number, look at the competitors as well. So uh, a good place for that is always Finbox. So we throw in Fubo here, uh, and look at a bit of a comparison of um, who are they comparing it with? Always a little bit random, but look at price to book of Fubo is 4.2, Roku is 16.9. Um, they're not making any money, so it's a little bit difficult there to evaluate. They're just not making any money at all. Dan spent half a million. So quite difficult to you know, put a real value number on, on companies that are not yet profitable. Um, you can look at um, EV, what's our enterprise value? Well, it's going up quite nicely. It's at 3 billion now, so it's growing quite nicely. Uh, and we can also have a look at what analysts think of this. Um, where did they go? Okay, let's have a, have a, have a look at the snapshot here. Uh, so, The party's just getting started, but that's seeking alpha. You always have to look at that with, with, with great caution. Uh, I, I don't see any, which is strange. Normally, I see um, analyst valuations, but I don't see any at all. So, yeah, it, it, it's a tough one, really. I, I, I'm not in on it, which you can probably tell, because I, I don't have the, the absolute insight on this one. But um, it certainly is a lot cheaper than it was. It's being shorted fairly heavily as well. Uh, but... Um, 
yeah, it's it's a tough one. I think really you need to do a proper uh, competitive benchmark against uh, you know their the real competitors and see how do the valuations compare, how do the growth numbers compare, how do the margins compare. That's really what I would recommend here. Um, uh, Tom, uh, uh, welcome to the chat. Uh, Tom, Tom, you want to call in? Uh, you, if you have Zoom, Tom, you can call in. Um, I've got someone here actually in the waiting room on an iPhone. I'm going to admit you. So, guys, um, let me pull that over. I hope that works on your end. And you're connecting your audio, which is lovely. Still connecting their audio. People don't seem to find Zoom that easy to use, right? Maybe we have to try something different uh, in the future. Let's have a quick look at the market. Well, VIX is still leading the market, which of course is, is not particularly wonderful because it's all volatility. Um, our iPhone chap here, um, if you can hear me. Um, oh no, it's still connecting to audio, okay. Uh, PDD is recovering, XPANG is now in the green, uh, JD as well, um, which is interesting. What's the story on XPANG here? Let's have a quick look on that. Well, nothing particularly. They just uh, feel like going up. Um, uh, Tom says, try StreamYard. It's easier. Um, do you mean for people? No, I'm, Tom, I'm, we're having people call in live. So people are calling on Zoom. They can call me. We've done it earlier. Uh, and uh, we can see them. We can hear them. We can talk to them. And people can actually have a chat with me uh, live here in the stream. So... Uh, that, that's what we are we're trying here um but the current guest is not really managing their audio so um sorry about that uh, mr iphone 11 friend uh, you are not uh, not working so um i'm going to put you back in the waiting room if you'd figure it out uh, let me know actually if you figure it out give us another call um Uh, Philip, okay, one stock in your portfolio is now green. Philip is saying the only one, which is plug. Uh, okay, um, I'm afraid here on the second by second chart, because my NASDAQ chart ticker subscription here is life. It's down 0.67%. Sorry there, uh, Philip, to uh, reduce the only uh, green thing in your portfolio today uh, to red. But yeah, very, very little green here at the moment. Um, uh, Felix, we can maybe do Discord calls a lot easier, says Chris. Well, yeah, but then people have to join the Discord first. But it's a thought. We'll, we will. I'm always open to suggestions, guys. Uh, StreamYard says has a link with a waiting room, says Tom Nash. Okay, Tom, you are uh, uh, you are now my official financial, <laughs> sorry, technical advisor. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. We'll, we'll try that um, if, if people are not so happy with Zoom. Um, um, Late Bloomer is saying Tom's done a great video on Bitcoin, so do check that out, guys. Um, Tom does great coverage. Um, and we will try stream it. I've tried it before, but not for call-ins. So we could do a temporary discount for the Patreon, says Chris. Uh, we, we can try things out. Uh, I mean, so far, it, it, it has worked. It just seems to be that uh, some people seem to struggle with Zoom, but maybe not everybody has it installed um, as well. Um, Lee, uh, Xpang, and Fisker are green. The interesting thing about Lee and Fisker are that they are both incredibly shorted. Uh, Fisker about 28%, Lee about 27% of short float. That's enormous. That basically means that one third of all shares out there are borrowed by sellers. So incredible uh, shorting there uh, on, in, in that market. Um, we just got a number out here. Gasoline stocks uh, were down uh, 1.9 million. Consensus was 0.88 million. So uh, US gas stocks are down more than expected. Probably a bit of panic buying, I would imagine, because of that pipeline. Um, so I don't think that'd be particularly useful. Uh, Tom, you're asking about my thoughts on the China BTC ban. Thanks for that, Tom. So China banned financial institutions from trading or holding Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in 2013. They basically reiterated the same thing in 2017. Uh, and I think they've just reiterated pretty much the same thing again. Um, so I don't think this is really news because even though Bitcoin uh, isn't illegal in, in, in China, um, in reality, you can't trade it. And it certainly is a no, 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 you just don't do it. So 
uh, there was uh, an article out earlier, but I, I don't see it now here. So I think it's a bit of a non-news item that's been recycled because, okay, here in Hong Kong, because we are just different jurisdiction, Bitcoin's everywhere. There are Bitcoin ATMs, absolutely exchanges everywhere. But on the mainland, there is no Bitcoin. There's no cryptocurrencies at all. What there is, is there is the um, blockchain renminbi, the official government currency, and that was created by the People's Bank of China, the central bank, uh, and who's uh, you know, developing that and is in on that. Of course, it's, it's Ant Financial, Alibaba, and Tencent, and Baidu, uh, those tech guys. And that's already in circulation in parts of China, so you can um, use that. And the idea is to basically reduce... Uh, transaction costs increase the transaction speed and efficiency and also allow people to move money from one wallet to another so say you have money in the alipay wallet uh, if you want to move it to your wechat pay wallet so far you have to send it back to your bank account and then back out which is obviously tedious so it'll allow them to do that directly and what it'll also allow people to do is that say rural communities who don't necessarily have bank accounts uh, they can receive renminbi directly into a wallet on their phone so if you are a farmer and you're selling apples on uh, on on taobao deals directly to consumers you can receive money into your wallet and that money is not speculative it is exactly one-to-one -to, -one to the the, the, the renminbi so that isn't really kind of cryptocurrency in the speculative sense that you know as, as we have it here uh, but it still it, it brings a lot of the benefit uh, that we we have here uh, so I think it's a little bit of a non-news item, to be honest with you. Of course, a lot of the crypto mining in the world is done by Chinese-owned companies, which is slightly ironic, but uh, those holdings are not, not held, obviously, in mainland China. Um, uh, so, uh, Rabi Sabi, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is just a regurgitation of the 2013 and the 2017 ban already, which is basically financial institutions can't trade it, can't hold it, uh, which means effectively, if you're mainland China, you cannot really hold Bitcoin. Um, and you also see that with some of the big banks, HSBC, for example, which is a British bank, but has a massive uh, headquarter here in Hong Kong, they don't accept anything like that. You can't buy coin stock if you are brokering uh, using the HSBC brokerage. That's how against they are. And they're saying, we will not allow our customers to buy highly speculative investments. So that's, that's the official line there. Uh, but having said that, we have every other uh, platform here. You can do absolutely anything from Hong Kong, but just on the mainland, uh, you can't. can't. Do you think they'll ban mining eventually, China, that is? Um, I don't know if they'll ban it. I mean, there are issues around the energy usage and that sort of thing. Uh, so they might come down in the, in, from, from that front. But I think mining is very movable. I mean, with a little bit of warning, you just move your mining somewhere else. Uh, you don't have to do it in, in mainland China. Um, I, I don't think mainland China loves the mining, uh, to be honest with you. So, uh, But I don't know what percentage of that is done in mainland China or outside of, of China by simply companies owned by Chinese nationals or people who are ethnically Chinese. So, um, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. Um, and Tom, you're absolutely right. Hong Kong is one of the best places to run an internet-based business from a regulatory tax perspective, totally. Uh, one of the easiest and most wonderful places and some of the greatest beaches in the world as well, which is, is, is nice. Um, I feel like Bitcoin is going to fall to around 10,000, says Sam G there. Well, I think, you know, you are, you are uh, being a little bit... Um, a little bit dramatic there, perhaps. Uh, what we've seen in the last couple of uh, hours, here's the chart. Let me throw at this. Um, uh, we wanted to throw out this some moving average lines, didn't we? Uh, where did it go? So we've fallen exactly here. We've fallen below the 200 day moving average line. And that's pretty significant uh, because previously we were always kind of trading around that. And that's that red line here at the top. So we've substantially dropped below that. Uh, and we are now here at, where are we? 35,000, crikey. If you look on this, uh, on this as a day chart, uh, so we've fallen out of a lot of our support levels here. Uh, what's really our support mark here? Well, you can see that in early January, we had these sort of similar level, levels, right? We had sort of 28,000, 29,000. It doesn't have to be super precise. Uh, to you, you can see that here, right? You had these uh, two uh, sort of, spots there. That's our next support. Having said that, we were today down to 30,000 and we've bounced back up $5,000. So it does seem that there is pretty solid support at 30,000 here uh, and people are willing to throw more money at, at Bitcoin.
yeah, I think that should be about, you know, there, thereabouts. It's it, it should start with a, with a three at least. Very hard to get these in place correctly, but you know, about thirty thousand. So, um, I, I think that therefore is a pretty good support level. Um, if it goes below that, uh, I'd go down here. What was the low on that day? 29,100 and 28,700. That'll also give us some more support. But where we are at the moment, I think 30,000 psychologically is quite a big point. A lot of people wish they had bought Bitcoin at 30,000 and they didn't, or they bought it then at 45, 50,000. So uh, at the moment, um, even though we are having a big sell off in terms of 24 hours, we actually uh, have a bit of a recovery from uh, the absolute lows here. If you look at this on an hour basis, um, you know, where, where we are now, 35,000, and you can see down here at 30,000. It is one of the funnest charts to do uh, live uh, technical analysis on because it moves so incredibly quickly. Every single pattern you ever want to see on a chart, you see it in Bitcoin every every couple of hours just because it's just that volatile. And, and you know, that's what, what you can see. So you can see here on the way up, 36,500, which is basically our 200-day moving average line, which is that one coming down here, this one. This is proving to be our resistance. It was here and then again um, just at sort of 10.30 um, New York time. So that's going to be the tough one to, to, to beat. And that's, of course, going to keep coming down if we are heading in this trajectory. So we need to break through that, what is at the moment sitting at about 36,000 or so. Uh, Tom, uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, and clearly kind of you to encourage people to hit the like button. Uh, join us tomorrow, whether we do Zoom or I might try out your stream yard, Tom. Thanks for suggesting that. Um, and one cent for the fluffy animals, of course, as well. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for your kind contributions. Uh, save the goats and hit that button. If you're wondering, the goat we're saving this month is this chap here. Baron von Goat, we are going to adopt him. And I'm hoping to send him more than 400 US dollars, which requires 40,000 likes. So each one matters. Um, uh, thank you, Hans. Now, is the market improving? Um, well, it depends, right? It really depends on what we're looking at here. Let's have a quick look at NEO and see what we're doing intraday. Um, not crypto, <laughs> uh, but uh, this. So we're looking at this on a, on a minute chart. Well, we're not really improving, uh, but we had a bit of a mini rally to 33 and now we're kind of zigzagging down again. Um, so we, we have to basically break through that 33.24 there to really uh, get us going. Uh, but at the moment, our, our volume it gives us a pretty good indication, right? It's all in the red, basically. Um, and we'll see a similar story with most of the growth stocks this morning. Um, and it is just another one of those uh, inflation panic days uh, which for those of us who are perhaps have a long-term uh, horizon, um, uh, are perhaps buy opportunities, but Palantir here looks made a quite a nice recovery. It started really falling off uh, and now we are moving up somewhat, right? So it, it is now still down 2.8%, which isn't, isn't fantastic, but we were today uh, at 1996. So $20 is still holding very nicely. Uh, Robbie Sabi, I love the goat's name. Yes, it's a very, very posh goat. If I invert my colors, my portfolio is green, says the bandit. You could also just get a um, Chinese uh, brokerage account uh, and because they, that's what they do. When things go up, it's red. When things go down, it's green because red is a lucky color. It's the color of money. So um, if I, uh, Anna Lynn, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, appreciate you, you watching. Uh, guys, if you have questions, do shout them out. Or if you just generally want to just hold your, uh, you know, uh, cover your eyes and, um, and and only listen to the good news. I'll try to give you the good news. Something is up today, and that's VIX uh, up 11.7%, uh, which is rather incredible. Uh, so volatility is definitely back of the vengeance. And um, let's have a quick look at some of our um, news items here as well. Let's have a look what's going on in terms of... So Nasdaq's down, S&P's down, but both about 1.2%, 1.5%, not enormous. Uh, but the, the VIX is up 18.7%. And that's, can you see that on the chart here in the middle? Uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, actually, it says 20% here on the chart. So uh, that really dwarfs us absolutely everything. Um, and if you see that, though, on the last month, we have been higher uh, on the um, 20, what was that, 12th of May. Uh, we were a little bit higher on the VIX. So, uh, but yeah, volatility is an issue for us. Um, if we look at um, 
Yeah, any sectors are up, no, everything. Energy down the most, minerals, financials, industrials are down the most. Uh, communications are not doing too badly, but still off 0.9%. Of and it is basically all markets everywhere in the world, Japan, France, UK, Germany, absolutely everything is just down a little bit. Gold is up. Gold is up 0.7 of a percent. Um, so that little gold bar um, uh, I, I was holding up the other day in one of our lectures, uh, on, on the course, uh, that is worth a little bit more now. I, I'll, I'll have to uh, wrap it up nicely. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is just one of those days where, um, let's have a look here. Coinbase is down for some users as Bitcoin sees massive sell-off. Ah, okay. So that is not going to be good for Coinbase stocks, which is why we see Coinbase off. Uh, I think it was 10% when I last looked, 8.9%. So it is bizarre that these exchanges keep seeing technical issues, uh, isn't it? Um, uh, the housing market is bottleneck. So Bloomberg put out BlackRock doubles its stays in SoftBank Group. Uh, okay, that's a long story. Um, big institutional investors are dumping Bitcoin and going back into gold, says JP Morgan. Okay, uh, according to Pippa Stevens, at least. Institutional investors are dumping based on open interest in CME Bitcoin futures contracts. The firm said large investors are shifting away from Bitcoin after favoring digital recovery, this currency over the gold. Um, okay, I don't really have to see if that's a short term story or long term one. Uh, Treasury is up, Matthias. Yes, there is something that's up. Uh, bond yields are probably up a little bit, though not that dramatically, surprisingly, right? We have that whole scare. No, bond yields, 10 year bond yields are down. Um, Let's have a look at the Americas ones. So all the US ones, okay, very short-term ones are, are up substantially, but the long-term ones are down actually, uh, which is um, slightly bizarre really. Anything from two to 30 years is actually down. It's only the short-term ones that are up quite substantially. So uh, not real inflation there, right? At least the bond traders don't see it coming. Uh, Chris says, do you think Neo can end this week above 35? I don't like seeing Neo below 35. It's that psychological support line for me. Um, well, let's have a quick look at it. I mean, we're not that far off it, uh, and the volatility is pretty uh, substantial. So let's go back to a day chart here for a moment. Let's go in a little bit. Um, can we go below th above 35? I think it's entirely possible. Uh, I mean, you, you see the volatility in this, right? It is, you know, up or down, uh, basically a couple of dollars each day. Uh, we we have sort of two to three, four dollars even uh, per day up and down. So it entirely is possible that people will tomorrow forget inflation and that there will be a growth stock rally. It is all, uh, all within the realms of possibilities. Um, uh, Nicholas uh, Camps, you're just joining us. Welcome. Uh, guys, if you just tuned in, you can call me on Zoom here and you'll be live on the channel. You'll be talking to me and I'll see you and I'll, I'll let you in into the call. So check that out if you, if you, uh, if you want to. Um, uh, Nicholas, uh, yes. Well, so the story on Palantir is that um, Peter Thiel's fund has bought, uh, it's called the Founders Fund. They bought 21 million shares of Palantir, which is a good story because we see all that insider selling, right? And here is the key shareholder, 16% shareholder, um, who is who is uh, who is buying some more. And the founders fund here it is. He's the the, the the basically the partner in Peter Peter Thiel. There are a couple of others, but he's obviously the number one. Otherwise, he wouldn't be at the top. And these are the companies they invested in: SpaceX, Palantir, Stripe, Facebook, Airbnb. So a fund that's probably doing pretty well. And they are throwing money at Palantir, and that is good. That is what we want to see because we want to get that institutional uh, buy-in up. <laughs> there are lots of dogs <laughs> on our Discord. Um, lots of fluffy creatures. You know, we, our institutional holdings at the moment are about 17-18%, uh, which was we shared, someone shared very kindly on our Discord earlier here. Uh, that's Palantir. And there's things like Facebook, Amazon, etc. They are in the 50s, 70s, even 80 percentage uh, range. So that's what we want to see. We want to get more institutions in here. Uh, so very good of Peter Thiel to uh, throw some of his funds money at it. Uh, Andrew T, Zoom calls. Yes, absolutely. So, Andrew, you can call me on Zoom. I'll put you live on here uh, and you can have a chat with me. 
Um, what a day. I had 17k standing by and I nearly decided to day trade the 1800 e uh, Ethereum low. Would have made 10k in 30 minutes with uh, uh, leveraging a uh, lol. Um, rugby, unfortunately, it's wood, isn't it? <laughs> but thank you for sharing. Uh, it was an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who are making a killing today um, on... Um, on um, all kind of cryptos here, right? I mean, uh, let's have a, have a quick look at Ethereum, uh, crypto, Coinbase, Coinbase will do. Uh, so it went down today to 18, what was it? Eight, 1900, and now we're back at two and a half thousand almost. So volatility there is staggering, absolutely astounding. Uh, and that is in a sense why people like it because it's fun, it's, it's happening, right? So, the good news, therefore, is that we have pretty solid support uh, when we go to uh, levels like 1900 or 2000, uh, and, and that is something people will remember, and therefore we are much less likely to um, to, to jump in on that, uh, to jump that low. But yeah, it is it is still you know it is still up from most days, except if you bought after 27th of April. If you bought in the last. Uh, 25 days or so then yes you are you are bleeding uh, otherwise you're probably still uh, doing uh, all right um uh, why be savvy you over elon uh, yeah he, he is he is uh, getting a a pretty um um strong following of of crypto fans who are really really not liking him very much at the moment right uh, go ev the bandit that's an interesting one i looked at that actually earlier today it is shorted the short float is 28 percent um canoe is the ticker Sorry, as a company, Go EV is the ticker, a great ticker, uh, but as a company, I, uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't go there. I'm going to show you why. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. It doesn't really matter what we look at, actually. Does it? What did I want? Okay, let's have a look at valuations. Why not? So, if you look at the news on this thing, news dashboard. All the news are basically uh, about um, law firms, um, you know, uh, and the SEC investigation. So companies under SEC investigations that have lost a lot of their management, uh, that haven't really produced anything at all yet, uh, look at the highlights of their financial analysis. Uh, their total revenue uh, is three million US dollars. I don't know what they sold, and they made a loss on that. Uh, in the last 12 months of 74 million. Uh, so not the greatest business in the world at that point. I mean, they are very early stage, I grant them that. But when you have these kind of um, you know, investigations, this is what happens to your market cap because people are, are, are pretty scared. Uh, so they jump out. So it is highly, highly risky at this point. Now, if you do know something that we don't know about it, uh, then perhaps there's something in it. But at the moment, we are below, um, you know, basically SPAC pricing. Uh, we are really down here in the dumps at 760. SEC investigations and those kind of things, unless there's real clarity on this this sort of stuff and it's some sort of regulatory overreach, uh, I, I personally would stay away from. Um, uh, Wabi Sabi is asking, do you cover crypto in your course? Um, Wabi Sabi, not yet, actually. Uh, it's something I might well add. At the moment, we cover things like technicals, fundamental analysis, uh, inflation investing, how to make a proper long-term plan to actually build wealth, how you can invest in any environments, how to identify good stocks. You want to see my core at portfolio, what I buy every single month, uh, a lot of those kind of things that really turn people from a kind of perhaps speculating into real uh, long-term, uh, hopefully success successful investors. But it is an interesting one with crypto. We talk, do talk about it quite a lot. All the technical analysis applies to crypto uh, because uh, crypto is all momentum. So actually, uh, we have two big um, uh, sections in our curriculum, which is all about technical analysis, uh, taking you from sort of basic levels to pretty advanced levels. So that it would be very, very helpful if you're trading crypto. Uh, what about workhorse? Um, yeah, absolutely. 36% um, shorted there as well. Well, okay, I, I tell you why I'm not keen on that one. And that is um, this here. Now, one of the most um, 
aggressive uh, investors out there is ARK. Uh, they are really happy to put their money on the line for future growth and innovation, uh, and they don't mind waiting, and they don't mind going against the trend. And look what they've done with their workhorse holdings. Uh, they've gone from holdings 5.6 million shares to a holding 7,000 shares. Uh, and they did that in the space of a couple of days, from the 5th of May to basically... Um, about a week they were out. So they are not liking what they're seeing. And if the most bullish uh, kind of investor out there is running for cover, quite literally, and not really caring whether they're losing money on it or not, um, I I'm definitely not going to touch that one. Um, Tom is here in the, in the Zoom meeting rooms. Apologies, uh, Tom. Uh, I'm going to admit you. Thanks for coming back. Uh, let's see if we can make this work. Here is Tom connecting to audio. Tom Nash, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and all you've got to do is hit that mute button. There you are. That's that's the meme of 2021. You are muted. That's the leading <laughs> meme right now. Yeah, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Turn on your video. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, great of you to join to join us, uh, Tom. Uh, always, I'm always appreciate uh, so you. So, Felix, tuning I'm in. sorry to take up your. So, uh, first of all, I love what you're doing. Uh, I love I love your channel. I love your insights. I think you're providing a very analytical, non-biased, very non-hypey uh, content, which is really enjoyable to watch. And I'm a huge fan. As you, as you can see, I'm on every stream pretty much. Uh, I think uh, we need more content like this. Uh, in fact, I admire you for not clickbaiting like me. <laughs> you are... You are exactly where I want to be someday, but I just can't help myself. Uh, but on the point... Yeah. Go ahead. So on the point of the... So I just wanted to offer my two cents in the... I'll be doing a live stream tonight uh, with actually a couple of cents uh, just to know about this. But I really have only two thoughts about the current situation with the Bitcoin since I'm not a cryptocurrency expert and neither do you. So we can just have two layman people talking about Bitcoin. And here's what I think. So I think, Felix, that basically the OGs in this community of crypto are probably not even taking this seriously. They're like, OK, here we go again. It's just a, it's, I mean, it's just a repeat of 2018. Um, and I think for the most part, uh, this is going to be a repeat of the of the cryptocurrency winter of 2018 with one little difference. I think once it releases back upwards, I think the, the bounce back effect, the rubber band effect, whatever you want to call it, is going to be stronger than it was in 2018. I think that's where you're going to see the 100,000, 120,000. But uh, no rush. It can pretty much take anywhere from two to four years to happen. So it's not like it's going to happen next month or next year anyways. I actually, Tom, thanks first of all for all those compliments. Far too many. Um, you actually, you know, you made me blush here on live on the air. Uh, truly appreciate, uh, Tom, uh, what you do, and you, you have a fantastic channel and a fantastic community. And I, I rather envy you for your ability to clickbait very, very successfully. Yet your content is absolutely solid and informative and always fun. Uh, so it's, it's you, you. I think you have the balance absolutely right there. So I, I have to keep watching how you do that. Uh, I love those dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> thumbnails you do uh, but yeah on on crypto i i think most people who are in crypto in a serious way appreciate that 70 percent volatility up and down is, is what comes with the game so i think you know us falling from 50 to 30 now back up to 40 wherever we are i think it doesn't really affect them because it hasn't we haven't seen a real change in the underlying story right we still have the us fed printing money like it's going out of business not giving us those numbers they're telling us inflation is very low not measuring asset inflations so all the kind of fears a lot of people have of a centralized currency with the us dollar you know think about it 25 percent of all the us dollars out there were created the last year, right? I mean, that is a pretty uh, dramatic number uh, for, for anyone to, to appreciate. And then you have all the other cryptos and all the benefits that come out of blockchain and all the applications. And, uh, you know, you have bonds being issued in Europe using Ethereum. And there's lots of actual real use applications for that. Um, so I think this is one of those blips and look back. I mean, we can have a look at the chart in a second here. Uh, you're absolutely right. We've had massive drops in the past and then we had massive recoveries. You get massive drops. Uh, the crypto guys just buy in more. It's just cheaper, right? It's like, you know, Christmas, Christmas shopping, basically everything is on, on sale. So I think 
I quite like Elon being out of this. I actually hope that Tesla gets rid of their Bitcoin because what I like about crypto and, and, and Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. We haven't got one person who is the kind of key man risk running this show. And Elon suddenly made himself, you know, the, the Bitcoin godfather or god or whatever. And therefore, we have this risk of one guy here. He's, he's, a, he's a very intelligent man. He's a genius. But he is a little bit volatile with what he puts out there, right? So uh, I actually would quite like him to talk less about crypto because it doesn't really benefit the space. We want a decentralization. We don't want a CEO. That's the way I see it. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tom. Tom's muted himself again. Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> No, I was I was trying to, but it, I had a notification that the host uh, disabled unmuting. Ah, <laughs> so, okay, you see, was, I'm a control freak. What can I say? Yes, I get it, uh, but it's totally understandable. So you know, I kind of uh, you know, when in doubt, just zoom out, right? Just zoom out Bitcoin, and you see exactly what's going on as just uh, the continuation of the existing pattern. The other thing most of these younger investors don't realize. Uh, because they got into cryptocurrency this year or probably late last year or mid last year. If you go back about 18 months back, not a lot, just a year and a half back, uh, Bitcoin was 10,000. Uh, Ethereum was what, like 200? Uh, Cardano was what, like six, six cents like a year ago? <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's still uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, it just got off a huge bull run. And usually what happens when you get off a huge bull run, you have a pullback. I mean, uh, so, so I don't really see anything out of the ordinary here. That's how cryptocurrencies behave, you know, exactly what you said. Absolutely. And I think people shouldn't be, you know, look at 2018, right? You know, look at those numbers and, and people just have to, as you say, literally zoom out. And that's always what I say to people when anything happens, zoom out on the QQQ or on Bitcoin or whatever, you know, you are invested in and just look at the long run and then decide whether uh, you want to sell when things have sold off and lose your money, like most retail investors, or whether you're going to ride the storm and possibly buy in a contrarian uh, manner here. Um, just going to have to get rid of the spammer here. Um, crikey. Uh, so... I think this is just what comes with the territory is that you are investing in a highly, highly volatile, you know, financial instrument for, for better uh, sort of word. And, you know, at the moment, it's below the 200 day moving average line. We haven't had that since uh, April 2020, right, since the last crash. So this is probably uh, one of the greatest buy opportunities Bitcoin is going to see, uh, perhaps for the rest of the year. So uh, I, I agree with you, Tom. I think people like to panic. And I think you know, there's so much news out there and, you know, even, even Bloomberg is clickbaiting shamelessly. And then that sort of carries over into the whole market. And that's where, why we see uh, market days that are up five, six percent. And then we have two or three days where we go down and then we go up again and we go down again. It's incredibly volatile. And really, I think if you are a regular long term buyer of your stock portfolio, which I think most people should be, and that's always what I try to teach, uh, those are the days when you can buy, right? And they're, they're great opportunities. So, so thanks, Tom. Apologies. I, I don't know why you keep getting muted. I ask you to unmute again. Uh, no, I muted myself because I don't want my feedback noise to interrupt with your story. So, and it really helped me get things into perspective. So uh, imagine you're an ant and you're crawling uh, on a football pitch and you're looking at a piece of grass and it seems to you like this biggest thing you can never imagine, like a 17 feet building, right? And uh, all of a sudden, imagine the view changes and you're the same and you're the bleachers all the way up. All of a sudden you see the patterns on the, on the pitch and that little piece of grass seems like almost insignificant. So that that's a really good story to kind of understand how you have to put things in a chronological sorry, chronological context um, in order not to uh, I mean not not to freak out or panic like I mentioned things are I mean investments in general have a lot of risk and especially at the end of the day if you have high conviction uh, I mean this really doesn't anything. You know what I mean, Felix? But I, again, I got to run. 
thank you so much for letting me join the, the stream. I really appreciate what you're doing. I'm going to try to dial in there, but uh, I just really got to run. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much for joining in. Always a pleasure to have you on the on the channel. Uh, and good luck with your live stream later. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, so, guys, yeah, I think I think uh, Tom always gives um, some 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 good insight and good perspective uh, on um, on. I think you know exactly when you have these days. Uh, look at the the longer term and look at things with with perspective. And even this kind of crazy drop here we have with with Bitcoin. When you zoom out in two years' time, it'll seem it's, it'll seem actually pretty irrelevant. And you know we have the same thing if you put this on a percentage scale. Um, you know, say where we were in 2018, we went down 56 percent uh, in in a, in a space of a couple of, of of a couple of days, really a couple of weeks. So this is just part of investing in crypto. And if you don't have the stomach for it, don't do it. There are plenty of things you can invest into which have much much lower volatility. And if you want to know what those are, I mean, that, that's one of the things I I always teach people on, on my course is you know. Not every asset, not every stock is for everybody, because if you want to invest in something that potentially can go up 50% in a year, you have to also accept that it might go down 50%, at least temporarily, and you have to be able to wait that out um, unless something is dramatically changed. I don't really see what's changed with Bitcoin. Um, it's just a bit of sentiment. It's Elon's tweets. And, um, you know, therefore, I don't think this really, really um, uh, changes things dramatically here. So um, someone's writing out CVS here. We've looked at that yesterday, actually. Oh, this this guy, God, with his spamming um, buzz off. Uh, so I'm going to hide you again. You don't really achieve very much. Um, you were clickbait hating by spamming. Is that really a particularly good way to get your point across? Probably not. If you have a question, ask it. If you have a criticism of a particular point I make, let me know. I'm, I'm, I always welcome criticism. So CVS is, is having a good day. Uh, well, not really a good day, but compared to the rest of the market. And of course, they are benefiting from possible fears that COVID might last a little bit longer. Um, uh, Rick is saying, hopefully a year on, we can look back and laugh. Um, and uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Chris, you can, can I ban IPs? Um, I don't know that I see IP numbers on here, but I can re can ban this chat, but he keeps coming back with different account numbers, names, uh, but never mind. It shan't uh, interrupt this too much. So yeah, I think CBS, I think it is a good stock fundamentally. Uh, They've obviously had a very, very good run. So you have to kind of think at some point, if COVID does go away, will they get punished for it? Um, or is this the, the fundamental business actually that great? Um, did you watch Eurovision? It says Dan there. No, I missed it, uh, which is, of course, a great tragedy. If you don't know what Eurovision is, guys, it's all the um, European countries and a few non-European countries uh, like Israel, for example, which isn't really on in Europe. Uh, and they sing uh, and it's it's usually rather entertaining. Uh, so it, it's a competition amongst the European nations and sort of strange neighbors. Uh, but no, I didn't I didn't didn't catch that, I'm afraid. Um, how much has Tesla lost on Bitcoin now? Are they still up? It's a good point, uh, future A to B. We don't know exactly. Oh, crikey, our friend is back. Um, <laughs> how, many, how many user accounts are you going to make uh, before you get that we are not interested? Um, we don't know exactly at what price point they bought. Um, they made money on it in the first quarter. We know that, uh, but we don't know what they've lost uh, at, at this point. No, we really don't know. Uh, they still hold more than a billion, though. though so um, I think um, you would think it would be in, in his interest uh, to keep that going, but we really don't know why. Um, <laughs> Dan, you're making jokes here about our Belarus chap. Um, He's trolling hard indeed. I predicted this crash and still bought Neo X Bank CCRV, says Roy. Well, if you are long term into things, then you know you can just sort of keep buying every month or so. Um, uh, Chris is suggesting that our little spamming friend is going to restructure his spam into simple, simple questions or messages. I, I, I'm with you on that, Chris. Um, I, I don't mind any kind of a question, uh, no matter how kind of aggressive. But spam isn't really going to get us anywhere. So at the moment, what are we doing here with the market? Well, we are down, not down as much as when we opened. And that's sort of the slightly positive here. Things like Facebook, Amazon are kind of crawling towards zero. Uh, Lee Auto down 0.8%. Um, 
Palantir still down 2.6 though, but above 20 at least. Uh, and coin reeling a little bit. Apparently, some people couldn't trade Bitcoin today, which isn't good apart from the whole Bitcoin sell-off as well. Um, Alexander, you're asking about why does is a company like Palantir affected by inflation? Well, to explain it in a very short manner, and, and I actually literally on my course, creep on quote below, uh, I've got a very, very long lesson on, on inflation uh, and then also in other ones on what you can invest in. Uh, what happens is that these growth stocks are valued on the basis of future earnings. So future earnings out over the next 10 years. So we're taking the profits in 10 years and we are valuing it back to present value. And when your interest rate goes up, the discount you have to apply to get it from future money to now money increases. And the way you could think about that is, say if I give you a million dollars in 10 years time, or I give you 800,000 right now, you probably take the 800,000 because you know you can make a return greater than 200,000 over 10 years. And it's a little bit like that. You kind of have to have that kind of work backwards to present value. So approximately very roughly each percentage point increase of interest rate uh, hits growth stocks by about 10% or 9% or thereabouts. Um, do I see a bandit here, a UVXI as a good buy? Um, I know it degrades over time, but with it being able to 10x, it seems like it has potential, but the volatility, it does have potential. I agree with you. It is the greatest, single greatest thing you can buy in a crash is UVXI. And I'll, again, I'll, let me show you that. Uh, it gives you absolutely staggering returns. If you had bought this in the uh, COVID crash last March, uh, you would have gone from, it's quite staggering, you would have gone up something like 1300%. Um, so you would have made a ton of money. You could have sold out of that. Maybe you would have sold it at a thousand percent up and then you could have bought, uh, you know, Tesla or, or whatever with that money and you would have made a load of money. But the problem is that it degrades over time. Uh, and why does it do that? Well, it always goes down over time. You see here, if you look at the long run, it's a it invests in volatility futures sort of between one to three months out. And when they come to closing those futures, when they expire, they always close at a loss. So UVXI is continuously loss making, except when there is a massive spike in, in volatility, because you've then bought the present volatility, which has gone up 10x, uh, at the price of no volatility from yesterday. So th that's why you have those massive returns. But it is a pretty, uh, as you can see, not something to hold on to. You hold on to this thing, you are guaranteed to lose money. So you need to feel that you have an inkling uh, that things are really going to go south. Um, and it's fairly hard to do in a normal market. If there is something catastrophic happening, then it's a good buy. Uh, you really, if you have some massive calamity, then jump in on it. And of course, COVID, if people did realize it, that's kind of the, the problem. Not everybody realized it, of course. Uh, but if you had some sort of a nationwide power outage, which would last several weeks or something, that's when you need to buy it uh, using your backup generator. Um, um, Uh, PG is saying, I'm not very impressed with Coinbase. The site crashed and didn't allow any dip buying. The site then came back online and it dipped 50%. Um, yeah, that's a very unfortunate outing there, PG. And a lot of the Bitcoin crypto guys will sort of see um, perhaps intent uh, there. I'm not saying it is, but uh, absolutely. Um, um, Coinbase is not meant for trading. You have to pay really high fees for each transaction. Absolutely. That's how they make all their money. 95% of their revenue comes from retail investors like you and me trading on there. Um, uh, Alexander, thank you. Got, uh, you got a bit of an answer there. Appreciate that. Um, and Neil, okay, you also had that happening and you guys are loading up on some more Bitcoin, which is uh, interesting. Um, uh, and Hans is saying UVXI is a daily hold no more than a few days. And yeah, you, you're absolutely right because you, you will just lose money. Uh, it, it is just one of those things. It's guaranteed to basically kill your portfolio. And it is fairly, fairly volatile. I mean, you know, if you bought this, say, on the 12th of May, you would now be down 14%. Um, if you bought this, let me see if I can move this any over anymore. No, I cannot. Uh, but it was down, you know, it, 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 it can move very, very, very quickly against you as well. So uh, I, I would say it is a an interesting one, but probably one reserved for uh, sort of catastrophes. 
Um, uh, Rudy Boy is saying, sell it within the day. Is current price for Neo a good entry point? Says uh, we sang. Uh, thanks for joining us. Well, I actually, before this video came out, I put out a, a, a technical analysis video, which includes Neo. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and basically what I'm saying is if you look at the momentum, um, it doesn't tell us that we are this particularly going up. Uh, so it doesn't give us particularly positive momentum. Of course, today is kind of unwinding any improvement in momentum we had. Uh, but also, you can't really ever time the bottom of the market. It's very, very hard to do. And no one ever gets it right, really. Uh, not at least in the long run. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the space we are in with all these inflation fears, that's going to happen at least once a month, probably twice a month when we get the inflation data, when we get the uh, um, FAMC minutes like today, and then every single time bond rates go up a little bit. So it is a very, very volatile market. So you have to ask yourself, is this a stock I'm going to hold for like five or 10 years because I fundamentally believe in the business and the growth strategy? And, you know, I, I like the 21% gross margins and those kind of things. And I think the brand is going to be good. And I don't think they're going to go out of business. In which case, of course, each dip is a buy opportunity. But what I always teach is I, I don't think buying one time into a stock is a particularly good idea. I think continuous buying, um, either automated on a sort of randomly monthly basis or using the dips to buy each time um, kind of cost averages you into it, whether it's going up or whether it's going down. And it's particularly important to keep doing it when it's going down uh, because that's kind of the, the psychological problem that most of us have that we, we buy here and there all the way up and then we stop buying all the way down um, and therefore, therefore, we missed all these opportunities to acquire the same asset at lower prices, which in the long run hurts us. Uh, Yun Chu, uh, what do you think about CCIV? Are we at the bottom? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it yet, to be honest with you, for because I just looked at the chart. It's still a, a pretty negative momentum story there. Um, why did you say do you think Shibu Inu is indeed the Dogecoin killer, as they claim? I mean, these stocks, these, sorry, these coins are, of course, the most volatile you can get your hands on because they are created kind of for fun. Uh, and therefore, sort of Reddit momentum can push them up substantially. You can make a ton of money on it. But that is also the most speculative side of, 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 of all the coins. Uh, I tend to lean towards the ones that have actually more usability. Now, I get if something like Doge or, or you know, it becomes popular enough, uh, the sort of usability follows. But I think there are a lot of others that perhaps have a little bit more uh, uh, substance to it. Um, uh, have we pretty much seen the bottom of the growth text already? Well, if you look at the increase in possible inflation and therefore how much we should discount future revenue of growth stocks, uh, then yes, we are there. But what you have to bear in mind is that rallies are always overshoot rational pricing. So when we were with NEO at sort of, you know, 60, $65, that was not really what NEO is probably in a rational world worth. So it makes it quite difficult to really assess, is this a fair price or not? Um, it certainly is a hell of a lot cheaper now than it was then. Uh, personally, I think that through the end of the year, we get more chips, we get more delivery numbers, great Q4 numbers. Uh, at the end of Q1, we're going to get ET7s rolling out. Um, we're going to get autonomous driving subscription there. I think that is really what's going to lift NEO, but it does obviously you know, take a little bit of uh, uh, momentum there. Um, uh, Rabi Sabi says, if meet Kevin mentions this course every code every three to five minutes. Felix is so elegant, he hardly mentions it. Well, my course code is down below and it's it's freedom. So check it out, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Rabi Sabi, for shouting that out. Uh, so guys, I think on that note, let's have a quick uh, peek on uh, what the market is doing here. It is, um, the sell-off is lessening. And what the data always shows is that as retail investors tend to trade in the first hour of the day, institutions tend to trade later in the day. So hopefully they're going to scoop up some of the bargains. And yes, things are down, but not down as dramatically as they were when we opened. Um, Tesla is still being punished here at 3.8% 3, 3 down. Uh, and coin recovering from them is down minus 10% earlier uh, on, on, on some outage, uh, people not being able to trade Bitcoin, which of course is frustrating. Um, Guys, on that note, I truly appreciate you all joining in. If you want to ask me any more questions, hop over to our Patreon. Uh, there's only one way to get there, and that is uh, 50 cents 
a day, guys. If you pay for the subscription uh, in advance, you actually get a free month as well. And that's a special offer uh, from the usual $23.95. Gives you the same full access. So check that out. You can ask me questions on anything. And you also have our lovely research, com research community and lots and lots of my research and news that I put over there every single day. So join me over there. Uh, and thank you very much for tuning in, guys. I appreciate you smashing the like and the subscribe button on the way out. And join us on the next call. Uh, see you on the next video, guys. At least two or three more videos coming out tonight. So uh, lots of stuff to look forward to.